Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to redo a soundtrack, the soundtrack on the Song of Moses. This is a very important topic. You know, I will use the old cliche, going to heaven, on our way to heaven. Well, these are the words, as we'll find, that those that overcame in the final generation, the false messiah, the, um, his ways, his trickery, his deceit, these are the words they were actually saying. Needless to say, they are very important because it's information that you must have in your mind or you're not going to overcome. It's that simple. Makes it very important. Now, we find um, the information concerning what you should know about it in chapter 15 of the great book of Revelation. Remember, the deception is spoken of in the 13th chapter of Revelation. And then chapter 14 gives you the events that are happening on earth, but 15 gives you the events that are happening in heaven, so to speak, if you would. And I find it rewarding, strengthening, and certainly comforting to know that you are in tune with our Father's Word when you actually know the information with understanding, of course, that you're supposed to have to defeat the deception of the end times. So, with that having been said, I can think of no other message that's more important in our Father's Word or comforting. Enough said on that subject, chapter 15, and verse 1 of the great book of Revelation, Song of Moses. Let's go with it. And I saw another sign in heaven, great. I mean, wasn't a little thing, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. In other words, the, our Father is very upset with the conditions in this world today in as much as we're in that generation of the fig tree, the final generation. And you, I don't have to tell you what people say about God. You know, all right, or how they feel about Him. And I speak in mass in general. But, um, and, and always bear in mind in the book of Revelation, the, the seven vials, the seven trumps, and the seven plagues are all the same. Uh, they, they run uh, and address the same subject. It just gives you a little different profile, a look, at what's transpiring at that time. Okay, so we see that. Verse 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. That means absolute purity, all right? No contaminants, absolute purity. And them that had gotten the victory, I repeat, the victory over the beast, that's to say the one world political system and the false prophet, the Antichrist, so to speak, and over his image and over his mark and over his number, and over the number, rather, of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. What do they have? They have the harps of God, meaning um, singing praises to our Father. Now, it's important that you know all these things. How do you get victory over a mark? By understanding it. In other words, if you were to go back to the 13th chapter and the 18th verse, you would know how to count that number. First off, first of all, you would have to take the word count and translate it back to the Greek in which it was spoken, and you would know that it wasn't count like one, two, three, but count by looking at the lots, the stones worn smooth by handling over a long period of time, and of course, the stone being the rock, the true rock, and then the fake rock by knowing who the Kenites are, quite frankly. That's what, that's what it comes down to. That's how you know the number. That's how you know the name is by observing as God instructed from the very beginning. That's part of the information. Okay, verse 3. 
and they sing the song of Moses. There you got it. These people, I want you to see this picture. These people that have overcome, that are on their way, they've overcome Satan, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast that everyone so fears. And what are they singing while they have these harps of God? The song of Moses, the servant of God. What was Moses? The lawgiver. God gave the law through him. And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, or the King of ages or nations, the elect, the upright. Here they are, the foremost subject that, that is being mouthed on this day, the day of victory, is the song of Moses. And quite frankly, if you don't know that song, friend, you got trouble. How are you going to sing something you don't know? Well, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to me. It'll either be in this generation or you won't be singing it with them on this day. Because it's those that overcame the deception that takes place now. Not on the way to heaven. These people overcame simply by knowing the words of the song. It isn't that you have to memorize the song necessarily word for word. Many have. Many of our students have. But it is desperately important. I could not stress it strong enough to know the words of the song. What was happening? What's he talking about? What took place? How could this possibly, this song, give us the victory over all those things because quite frankly by the time you take the beast and this is drawing from the 13th chapter his image his mark the number of his name uh, I mean you've got the victory that gives you victory then the question would come well I've never heard of the song of Moses before then it's well that you now hear so that you can learn Many ministers might say, well, all you got to do is be saved. Saved to what? The false Messiah? If you're not taught from God's Word, this letter that He has sent to you, whereby you're not biblically illiterate, then you should know the song. So today is the day to learn the song of Moses. Where is it located? We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Well, that's way back in the Old Testament. You got it. You listen to somebody that says to you, the Old Testament is already passed, then you're, you're uh, listening to the wrong person. You're listening to someone that's biblically illiterate themselves as far as being past history that is not a type for things that are yet future. The Old Testament has more about the millennium than the New Testament does. We find the Song of Moses in this great book of Deuteronomy, all right? That's why Moses, the lawgiver, naturally you find it in the law. Let's pick it up, if we may, in chapter 31, verse 28. We're going to identify that indeed this is the Song of Moses. Verse 28, and it reads, Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. These are very important words. 29, for I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days. Now that's today because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. Verse 30, And Moses spake in the ears of all, how many? All the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. In other words, enter on the scene, Song of Moses. 
let's analyze this song. It is, I could not, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I could not emphasize enough at how important this information is to you because this tells you how to have that victory. Verse one of the great song, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. In other words, this is our Father speaking through this song of Moses. And it not only, as we were in Revelation, as I pointed out, that chapter 14 pertains to the earth and 15 to heaven. The subject is and pertains to and is about both heaven and earth. Verse 2, my doctrine, the word is likeh in the Hebrew, and it means good teaching. My good teaching shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. The purest water that man can, may attain in a clean atmosphere, the very dew from heaven. As the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. What does that do? My good teaching is what gives life to those tender plants. Well, you yourself may be a tender, very sensitive person, but the good teaching of this word will give you life both um, in the early rain and the latter rain. The early rain, of course, is that that starts you on your path to growth. And of course, the latter rain is the rain that matures your fruit that is to say, makes you a mature person whereby God can use you. Verse three, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. The great promises of God, the great acts of God, the father of all people, the life giver, the creator, of all things. Verse 4, he is the rock. I want you to note the uppercase on the R. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now, the word rock is utilized five times in this song, which means grace, all right? And there is grace within it. Why is it that when we say he is perfect for all his ways or judgment, do some, some Christians just cringe? You mention the word judgment and they just cringe. You see, do you truly understand the word judgment? If you are given a judgment, Let's, let's say in, a, in man's court, if you're given a judgment, if you're the, offend, uh, the um, uh, offended party, it's payday for you. It's rewards for you. It is the wicked that are penalized at judgment. The word judgment means reward for those that are worthy. And God is absolutely, completely, totally fair in his judgments. That's man, man on earth says, why is it the wicked people always win? They don't. By the time all is said and done, God's perfect judgment will give the wicked everything they've got coming to them all at one time. Some of them that will be a quick ride and a slippery slide, all right, to you know where. That's, he is perfect as he should be. I don't know, what have you got coming to you? Would you like to get everything that God owes you all in one chunk? Think about it. A Christian or a child that loves the Father and lets him know should not cringe at judgment, but should smile and be anxious for that day. But the play on the word rock, your foundation, is to stipulate that there is another rock. 
If it were to be utilized here, it would have a, a lower case because it's Satan. That's why the word Tyrus, which in the Hebrew means stone or rock. And that's why you use the stones to enumerate or count his number. If you're not aware of that, I'm sorry. Um, you're hurting just a little bit. Not hurting a little bit, a lot when it comes to knowledge and information. So make a mental note, he is our rock and there is no other. We love him and we won't follow anyone else. We are the sheep and he is our shepherd and sheep know their shepherd's voice and they run from the voice of a stranger. All right, verse five. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. He's talking here about the Kenites, all right? And it goes all the way to Matthew chapter 13, and the parable of the sower. Jesus said, you gotta know this parable or you're not really going to understand any of them. You've got to know this song that gives you the victory or you're really not gonna overcome all that much. And I can hear some pastor right now say, like, I've never heard the like. It's all it is is salvation. Salvation to who? There's two rocks. And if you teach people to jump on the bandwagon to the first Messiah that appears soon, I'm sorry, he's the fake. And you've led your children straight into Satan's arms because you haven't taught God's word. Their spot is not the spot of God's children. Why? They're not his children. The souls he created that dwell therein. But Kenites, meaning the sons of Cain, their spot is not our spot as it is written many times. You wanna know who planted the seed? Then go to the 35th verse of chapter 13 in the great book of Matthew from the words of Jesus Christ as he explains the parable and you'll learn who the fa their father is and why their spot is not our spot. I will repeat, Matthew chapter 13, begin reading with verse 35 and go to the father of the tares, which is to say Kenites, verse six. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath brought thee? Question. Hath he not made thee and established thee? In other words, are, are you looking at some other father? Are you being pulled off by deception or do you have your eye on the rock? Well, how do I know? Right here, his word. Not man's dribble, not man's traditions. This word, verse seven. Remember the days of old. This is why he said, go get you the elders. Think back, look at the types. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee. Thy elders and they will tell thee, verse eight. When, when what? when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated, I repeat, divided, separated the sons of Adam, eighth day man. Adam in the Hebrew tongue is ruddy complected. That's what it means, no more, no less, to show blood in the face. I don't apologize for that fact. And many of you with newer translations, this word will have been changed to read M-E-N or M-A-N in English to show you how the little Kenites jockey your works for you anyway and some would never know the difference. Separated, divided, Adam. He set the bounds, boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. God loves all his children. God has a plan of salvation for all his children, but you had better know those that are spotted. Now that does not have to do with anyone's appearance, unless you know the mark of Cain. It has nothing whatsoever to do with man's appearance, but the spot of Matthew chapter 13, as again, as you begin reading at verse 35 and understand who fathered, who sired, the Kenite. 
Jesus himself would repeat the same thing again in John chapter 8, verse 44. Who was the first murderer? It was Cain, of course. You'll find out there who Cain's father was. Verse 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, which is always used as the natural seed, is the lot of his inheritance. This word lot means a cord, a, a cord of measuring. When they encamped, they measured each man his section or space. And this is why today in English we have a city lot. It means that it is lotted out, measured. Verse 10, he found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him. He kept him, that's to say he guarded him as the apple of his eye. Now, I don't, do you know what the apple of the eye is? It's the pupil. How, what lengths do you go to to protect the pupil of your eye? Well, naturally, that's probably the most sensitive part of her body. And we have this automatic uh, eyelash, that uh, blinker, that protects that eye. And certainly, that's what we protect more than anything, even in modern day. Be sure and wear your goggles if you're going to grind on metal, you know. Protect that eye. Protect your eye. Well, God protects his own even as a man would protect the pupil of his eye. That means being very careful. And here we have it. This is the song. Uh, I'm going to repeat this occasionally as I teach it because I don't want your minds to drift from the emphasis that you must know these things to defeat or to overcome the false shepherd that shall appear and his children which are perverse and crooked. The word generation in the Hebrew is offspring, his children, his offspring. I'm referring to verse 5 of this very chapter. God protects his own. All children are God's. And he has a perfect plan of correction and to win over if a person listens to his word. Go the way of the world and you know where you go. Verse 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them, beareth them on her wings. 12. So the Lord alone did lead him and there was no strange God with him. There was no Antichrist there. There was no other little old idol as he led him. What this is saying is God is as a great eagle that protects her young. That means if they were to fall out of the nest and the evil is there, eagle is there, she will even go under and, and carry them, bear them up on her wing. So God, when you're in a precarious situation, he's there. He protects you as the very pupil of his eye. He protects you. Those that have eyes to see. And as you are in a dangerous, precarious place that you're about to fall off the edge, he will support you. If you love him and if you call yourself of him. But if you want to go the way of the world, Hey, have a good trip, friend. Enjoy it while you can. It's going to be over with soon. Verse 13. He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. All the great olive trees that can grow from crags and rock and bring that beautiful oil of our people. An oil and a fat from the very tree that will not harm you or hurt you. And uh, that God set aside as the oil of our people. And um, excellent for everything from anointing to cooking. Uh, not to confuse the two, of course, uh, duties or reasons therefore. 
the fruit of the land, he gave it to us. Adam had the ingenuity to know how to farm. He didn't have to just hunt and eat raw meat. God taught us how to farm. For he, on the eighth day after he rested one day, he noted he did not have a man to till the ground. I know there would be some that would say to you, hey, hey, um, uh, that's not true. It's just a repeat. There would be some that would say that to you. Let them show their ignorance, for indeed they are. And uh, quite frankly, I'll, I'll go ahead and insert this in as much as we've gone this far. There are scholars in the Americas today that know that is a true teaching. And I have even been warned by some of them, don't teach it as it actually is. Because they will call, they will say it is a subject of racism. It isn't. And it's just that they're not bold enough to step forward with truth for fear that the American people or the, and the people of the world are not intelligent enough to see truth when they hear it. To see and hear it. That means to hear with understanding. Whereby you see the whole picture and you understand why God has more than one uh, child. That he has many children, many races, and there's nothing racist about it. But he had this man to till the soil for a purpose. It would be through him that Christ would come and made it plentiful. Verse 14, butter of kine, that means from the cow, and milk of sheep with fat of lambs, a fat that will not hurt you as nearly as bad as some other fats. And rams of the breed of Basham, that means the word Basham means fruitful, uh, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat, the very embryo of the seed itself, the wheat germ. And thou didst drink the pure, and this word pure means unmixed blood of the grape. Uh, that really needs no explanation, and that's what you should take in um, uh, Holy Communion. He, he really takes good care of us when we, take, uh, pro, uh, when we take our love and place it before Him. If you want to sacrifice something to the Father, especially, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on a very personal uh, level here, sacrifice your love to Him. Make it sacrificial. Love Him enough that, and you had better love Him more than any other entity. And then those blessings flow. In other words, our Father owns everything. He created it. It's His to give to you. But you've got to earn it. That's what judgment is, again. He's, he's, he's a very good judge. He knows exactly what you can take care of, and that's why you have exactly what you do today. Do you want me to say that again? God knows you, and He knows what you deserve and what you can take care of. And that's how much he gives you is what you can take care of. All right? Verse uh, 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat. Or Jeshurun. Uh, uh, let me pronounce it. Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art growing thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteem the rock, our foundation of his salvation. The, the word Jeshurun is a word that means supremely happy, the prime root in the Hebrew, supremely happy. Good time, Charlie. And our people have been that way since the beginning of time. It would seem a great many of them are. You let the good times roll, and they forget about the rock. They could care less about God. Well, let's go lay one on again tonight, Charlie. Hey, you know, we don't have anything to worry about. Let's go have a good time. Well, we should study God's Word perhaps a little bit. Ah, oh, we can do that in the next generation. Let's go have a good time. Live it up. Hoop it up. And they turn their backs on God. And... 
and a few good time Charlies uh, fr from generation to generation, they totally forget about our Father. They forget from whom those blessings flow. They forget from whom um, that uh, our peace of mind, our sanity, our understanding comes from. For without the knowledge of the Word of God, there is no understanding of this world. There is, there is no way that anyone could understand the direction that this world is going today except one understood the Word of God. Many people think it's a big deal that we hear these words, the New World Order, for about the last three or four years. Hey, it was written, we've been teaching that for 40 years that it would come in, in this generation. And it has. It's not unusual to hear it even on television now, the New World Order. It's coming. Good times and people forget, but with God's knowledge and His information, the truth reigns supreme. It's right where He said it would be. It's happening exactly as He stated. Again, I must remind you, this is the song. If you want to know what's the, on the lips of those that overcome and are on their way to heaven, this is what they're saying. This is what they're singing about. When the good time Charlies come along, if you're not careful, you lose everything. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. Do you want to know what angers are God? Just, just start doing contrary to his word, whether it be your health, your, your beliefs, like... Uh, Rolling, uh, chasing quick like a bunny and sexual orgies that work themselves into the Sunday school classes for little children? In the name of God, is it any wonder that he is angered at people? Verse 17, they sacrifice unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that come newly up. That's to say, um, a new religion from far, whom your fathers feared not. Um, I mean, they start, if they start um, anything to draw a crowd, all right? And uh, they, we could call it up the hoop up, popcorn. I, I mean, I could go on and on of the religions I've known down through my lifetime. In such a short few years, really, it would seem like that the new fads that have come along, oh, you just got to get into this. And um, I'm sorry, I will remain with my father's word. But we hear these new fads and new religions and unfortunately traditions of men sweep in until actually many questions that we are asked are are rooted in traditions of men and have no biblical base or background. It's simply what men talk about. And those people are biblically illiterate and think that it's Bible. It isn't Bible at all. It's not of our Father, many times, verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. You've forgotten who the true rock is. And many of you right now that would say, well, what does he mean, a perverted people? I never heard such a thing. I just will not hear that. Well, hey, go ahead. But you'll either know it, or you'll be deceived in the end generation. Hey, um... We can still love you, but you need to get into your Father's Word and listen to Him and not traditions, not some new religion. And it is comical at some of the new religions that begin. And I, 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 won't, I won't talk about it anymore, but, but uh, it really, you question someone's sanity and how insulting some things are to our Father that people do in a holier-than-thou attitude. 
It's really amazing. We'll finish this in the next lecture. We're just now getting to the part that you have to know. I mean, you have to know these things that lay the foundation. But he's going to tell you how it is that you overcome. Naturally, you overcome by what you learn today, by knowing who those are that have spots that don't match with our fathers. That should really pick the ears up. Well, we'll check it out in the next lecture as we finish this great song of Moses that you must know to have the victory. It goes hand in glove with salvation. It becomes a part of the New Testament when Christ made it a part of the New Testament in Revelation chapter 15. How are you doing, friend? Did you know it? Well, stick around. You'll learn when we pick it up in the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you?